Hello everyone and welcome to the RSA. My name is Mary Ryan. I am joint head of the public program here at the RSA and it's my very great pleasure to welcome this evening's fantastic speakers, Robert Peston and Kishan Coria, who have written the excellent new book, Bust, Saving Our Economy, Our Democracy and Our Sanity. I'm sure <coughs> Robert needs very little introduction to you all. He's one of the most well-known, trusted, and authoritative journalists in the country. A multi-award winning broadcaster and author, he is currently political editor for ITV and host of its flagship politics show, Peston. He's joined tonight by his editor on Peston, Kishan Coria, who also makes ITV's election debates and, of course, most importantly on this occasion, is the co-author of BUST. We are very privileged indeed to be hosting their very first conversation about the book. It's quite literally hot off the press. Today is publication day. So I do hope you will uh, make sure to get yourself a copy in the foyer after the event. Or if you're watching online, hello everyone out there, via the special event link in the chat. Um, and when you do get your book, you will see that the cover is graced by a ringing endorsement from the RSA CEO, Andy Holding, uh, who describes the book as brilliantly candid, timely and perceptive. And it really is an engrossing and illuminating account of the multiple fractures that have scarred our economics and politics in recent years. But importantly, it's far from simply a litany of despair. The book aims to kickstart fresh and energetic new debates about how these fractures might be mended. And where better to start that debate than right here with you all tonight? As RSA fellows in the room and online and regular events attendees may have picked up, this year, we've been asking all of the incredible public thinkers gracing our stage to consider the very same question, what could go right? <laughs> so, alongside their diagnosis of what's gone wrong in recent years, we're very much looking forward to hearing Robert and Kishan's prescription for repair and renewal. Where they're seeing some signals of a better future ahead for the UK and the wider world, and some of their own ideas about the practical policies, innovations, and alliances that can help us get there. So the format for the hour ahead is that Robert and Kish will, will kick off by introducing some of the book's key themes and questions for the first half of the session, and then it's over to you in the audience. We're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts too. too. So if you've got a question and you're watching online, um, and I know many of you are, then please do post uh, that in the chat or on Twitter using the hashtag RSA Economy, and Kish and Robert will try to get through as many as possible before we wrap up at 7 p.m. So a uh, lot to get through uh, this evening, great stuff in store ahead. So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Robert Peston and Kishan Coria. Well, this is gonna be a slightly surreal one because usually I spend most of my time talking to Robert in his ear and asking him if it's possible to have discussions with really eminent people who have lots of things to say in about eight minutes. And today we have about half an hour and I'm about to learn just how hard his job really is. Um, I think, Robert, we should probably start with the title of the book, which is Bust. Mm -hmm. And sort of, I think one of the things we spoke about a lot when we were talking about the book and starting to write it is, how do we make a book that's essentially called Bust and suggests that in many ways Britain and the West is in danger of going bust, feel hopeful, feel like it isn't fatalistic, and actually it's something that's quite patriotic because accepting that things aren't going well is the first step to making them better and pretending everything's going wonderfully perhaps doesn't help us do that. So on the title, when we say the West and Britain is in danger of going bust, I suppose we should probably say what we mean. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to say a couple of things before we kick off. Um, first of all, because I suspect I'm gonna get a question on this. Um, Obviously, all insights that we've taken from the Shadow Chancellor, we have attributed. <laughs> um, 
the other thing uh, uh, we, 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 I, I'd like to point out, uh, this is more in self-defence, my general, uh, having done a few of these events over many years, people who come and hear about talks are generally the nicest people in the world, and it's very lovely to see all of you here. Um, it is slightly surreal to have uh, Kish not in my ear uh, saying things like, you can't say that, or <laughs> let him answer the question, or, you know. Uh, 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 and I wanted to talk a little bit before I get directly to this issue of the importance of facing up to the, you know, significant challenges we face, um, about why we've done this together. And it's because we have both similar and contrasting experiences. The similarity is that we are both from immigrant families. Uh, uh, you know, I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. All my family came over at the end of the last... Ninth, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and my family's story is one of extraordinary upward mobility. You know, Dad starts in the East End, ends up in the House of Lords as a distinguished professor of economics. Um, and uh, uh, Kish's uh, family from a, uh, essentially a Hindu-Indian background end up uh, as doctors, and uh, Kish in his very distinguished position now. And both of us have therefore been great beneficiaries of this country. And uh, we start by essentially saying how grateful we are to have been given a home here. Uh, and one of the things that we regard as pernicious is the othering that goes on uh, within this community. It was not that long ago where I was massively optimistic that we were building a much more tolerant, inclusive society, but we have massively gone into reverse over the last decade or so. And so it's not just the economics that we focus on in this book, it's also the cultural and social fractures that we are experiencing. But as somebody who, I suppose partly because of who my dad was, uh, has a slightly irrational belief that economics can more or less explain everything, I think we do have to s start with the economics. And I think a lot of the fracture stems from what is now 15 years of low growth, widening inequalities, um, and suppressed, stagnating living standards. Uh, and so in terms of the series of events that are really important, to sort of understanding the challenges that we face now. Um, for me, the starting point is the crash of 2007, 2008, because that was the beginning of the great stagnation. Now, those widening inequalities, the winner takes all nature of this financialized and digitalized economy, that, you know, is of older origin. But people will put up with widening inequalities when they themselves have some optimism that their living standards are both growing and capable of growing. And we've seen that eroded, that confidence in that ability for the vast majority of people to enjoy better lives. We've seen that eroded over, year, over many, many years years now. And just as one very simple way of grasping the change, between 1992 and 2007, that's the start of the crash, uh, the average growth rate of the, the economy, of GDP, was 3% per annum. And there wasn't a single three-month period between 92 and 2007 of economic contraction, let alone two quarters, which is the official definition of a recession. So this was, a, this was a, effectively an economic golden age, and productivity was rising uh, again. Uh, and although inequalities were worsening, as I say, it was sort of tolerable because everybody was being... It was felt to be tolerable because everybody was being lifted 
up. Since 2007 8 the growth rate, I mean, initially it fell by a third. We are now, this is, I mean, we're not growing at all at the moment. We, we are conceivably right at this particular second in a recession. Um, but the sustainable growth, growth rate is probably about 1%. That's the rate at which we can grow before we have an inflationary problem. We've got an inflationary problem right now, as you, know, you might know, but we're talking about this, you know, an age where maybe we'll get inflation back down to around 2%. So that is the growth rate falling by two-thirds, which is an absolutely dramatic change. And the other thing that we are seeing... I'm afraid to say, is what little growth there is not in, the, you know, lifting up the living standards of the vast majority. Um, uh, and, you know, as I say, associated with that, new industries, particularly the digital uh, and uh, essentially more technologically advanced industries, where effectively the fruits of their growth and their profit accrue to a very small number of either founders or investors or inventors, and the fruits are sh shared more unequally than at any time since the late 19th century. So these are incredibly challenging times. And to get back, though, to um, uh, Kish's initial point, I mean, I've been delivering messages a bit like this for some time, and people think that I'm gloomy and a pessimist. I'm not, right? What I, my consistent message is, you cannot fix problems unless you can see what they are. Uh, you know, and one of the things we try to do in this book is be honest about the very significant challenges that we face. Um, but also, as I say, come up with some prescriptions. And I might throw some of those ideas for change to you later on just to see whether any of them remotely appeal. Um, but um, that, 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 that was my two-minute answer, as usual, um, going on slightly longer. But, Kish, um, wh where should we go next? Well, I think a couple of things that you were talking about. So, first, one of the reasons we, we, we collaborated, and hopefully I think you agree we collaborated quite well on this book, is that we both agree that the economy is central to things. I mean, 2007, 2008 being hugely important. For me, I was studying economics for the first time in 2007, 2008. I was learning about the Wall Street crash in history at school in 2007, 2008. And then Robert sort of broke on television that it was all happening again. Up until that point, growing up in the 90s and the Blair and Brown years, I sort of assumed the economy always grew. I mean, with hindsight, that was a ridiculous thing to think, but it was of the time. Politics was quite stable. The economy was doing very well. So the story that we tell here is one that you've been warning about for a long time, and that's become the story of my professional life as I've gone into journalism like you, which is decline which seemed like it wasn't going to be a thing when I was, when I was growing up. But on the, the economy and the centrality of the economy, so we, when we say that Britain is in danger of going bust, and there is a question mark after bust before you think that Robert really is much gloomier than he says he is, um, it's not just the economy and living standards, it's what is happening in the economy and living standards and what that means for democracy, what it means for the way that we communicate with each other, what it means for our politics. Mm. So I thought, Robert, maybe it's worth saying a little bit about, we'll come back more to the economics and to inflation and interest rates, growth, debt, but what are the impacts of a lack of growth, a lack of belief in the system for democracy and what we say on the front of the book, our sanity? So, uh, one of the things that uh, we argue, um, and actually I talked a bit about this in my previous book, WTF, is that that vote to leave the European Union um, was, not in the case of everybody who voted for it, but certainly for the swing voters uh, in the Midlands and North, it was basically a statement by them that they felt completely abandoned by the people in Westminster when it came to the way that the uh, economy was being managed. They could see in London and the South East living standards uh, rising very sharply. Their living standards were stagnating. And although it wasn't, in my view, rational to blame Brussels and the European Union, and in fact, during the referendum campaign, 
I said night after night on ITV, um, if we leave the EU, we will be poorer as a nation. Um, they, I think it wasn't so much that they believed the nonsense that leaving the EU uh, was going to make us all richer in the short term. I think it was just that they needed to register a protest vote about it. And, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing across the world is democracy in retreat pretty much everywhere you look, on every continent. So, to some extent, I take some confidence from the fact that this protest, that the people who were running things weren't serving their interest, was manifested in a democratic vote. The problem which we have, and this is a really big problem now, is that those people feel that they've been let down. You know, the people who argued in favour of Brexit said they would make these people better off, and they are not better off. And the thing that worries me is that, you know, we take democracy for granted. We sort of assume that people will, you know, get the change they want through the ballot box. But what if they don't? What if we go through another p period of years in which these people were promised that their lives and living standards would ma be made better uh, by leaving the European Union? And in practice, their lives become harder and harder. At what point do we recognise as a nation that, you know, they may do what's been happening in other countries and simply choose an undemocratic an extreme populist solution. So I do think that where we are in that sense is, you know, it's, this is a critical moment uh, in, in that sense. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Should, should, we, should we talk a bit about, the, the, you know, some of the things we say which make me more optimistic? Is it, would that be a good yeah, idea? I think I think we should be more optimistic. And also, just, just to finish on what you were saying there, the sort of the lack of faith in the system, be it economic and political, the sort of turn towards populism, there's sort of sometimes a view that this is something that's predominantly held by older people. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think if you look at some of the polling data, we've done it on the Peston programme previously, younger people are more pessimistic about their economic prospects than older people. They are convinced that in their generation will not be as well off as their parents. And you start to see some little signs in the polling data of the fact that there are some elements of authoritarianism and, pop and populism and some models of the way that things are run in other countries that younger people are more prone to thinking may be a good idea than older people. So I think that if the system doesn't correct itself in a better way, there's a problem with the young that we need to, we need to talk about at some point. To get and, on to the hope... And, and just on that, I mean, you know, there's a very significant problem with the young in America at the moment. Yeah. Um, particularly young men uh, who, you know, are astonishingly attracted to Trump. Uh, young women less so. So, you know, we can't pretend that there aren't examples around the world that should trouble us. Definitely. Um, to move on to the hopeful stuff, yeah. I think one of the things you've been most enthusiastic about, and due to your enthusiasm I've learned a bit about while writing this book, is you really do think that there is hope in artificial intelligence when it comes to our economic predicament, even if there are worries about other elements of it. So... Here's the, here's the time. We, we can finally talk about it, Robert. What is your take on AI? <laughs> um, so, uh, as, as a bit of a geek, um, I am just intrinsically excited by uh, any uh, technological development. Um, and I am incredibly excited about the productivity gains that artificial intelligence will, uh, will deliver. Right? I don't think there's any... I don't think there is any doubt about that. The doubt around uh, artificial intelligence is, will those productivity gains accrue to enough people, right? Or will they again be scooped up uh, in this winner-takes-all model by the owners and the investors? Which is one huge question. Um, secondly, this is, in my view, an industrial revolution. Um, and if you look back to previous industrial revolutions, there, you know, there is this phenomenon which some of you have come across called Engels Pause, where for many years during the de 
deployment of a new technology, millions of people again on the lower incomes lose their jobs, wages stagnate, um, and they pay a big price for a transformation of an economy. Um, and so just on the economics of this, there is a massive change for our leaders to understand essentially the, both the potential of what's happening with the deployment of this general purpose technology, but secondly then take steps to take the people, to, to protect the people whose jobs will change, sometimes for the worse, and in many cases whose jobs will just disappear. Um, and I just want to give you one very simple example of the kind, this is just, you know, of, of, of the kind of social consequences of, of AI. Um, so they're already, you know, uh, programs that can be deployed in customer service, right? And if you give these um, artificial intelligence uh, services to 18-year-olds, they can provide customer service quite as efficiently and adequately, in fact, in some ways more, more productively than somebody who's been doing the job for 30 years. And so, inevitably, in a market-based system, employers will hire 18-year-olds on low wages and either sack the, their older workers or simply suppress the entire pay structure. Now, we are a massive service economy, um, and so just one aspect of these changes will, over the next couple of years, have profound impacts on people's wages. And, you, and therefore, what you want is a government actively seeing these challenges and taking steps to address them. Every, every, every government, every political party talks the talk of lifelong learning. Um, you know, uh, apprenticeships at all the stages of your career to learn new skills. In practice, delivering these uh, educational uh, you know, opp opportunities for older people ha have proved very difficult to deliver. But this is an occasion where we cannot fail because the human consequences will be very significant indeed. But if you then also think about the ability of many of these services to transform, for example, the delivery of health, right? So the diagnostic ability of many of these programs is extraordinary. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, the, 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 the way that you can free up, you know, we have, a, what is it, 100,000 people short in the NHS at the moment? Um, you know, this AI for the NHS is definitely not a threat. What it ought to, do, what it ought to be seized upon uh, is as this tremendous opportunity to, you know, come, you know to, to, to make some inroads into these terrible um, uh, waiting lists, which are literally shocking. Now, there are issues around this, and, and one of the things that is, um, you know, is challenging is the way that we have bureaucracies here that panic at the deployment of uh, technologies like this. So three years ago, I don't know if you've come across um, uh, a very advanced um, AI business belongs to Google. It was actually created in the UK. It's called DeepMind. And DeepMind uh, went into the Royal Free Hospital uh, in northwest London about three years ago and started to do some pilot work on using um, AI to improve delivery of health services, um, there was immediately some kind of outcry about patients' privacy being invaded and data being misused. And obviously, we all, we all are, must be um, sensitive to privacy issues and you know, data not be, you know, our personal data not being stolen or misused. But rather than finding a workaround, everybody just panicked and they closed the project down. And that was a massively missed opportunity. We do have to be courageous in these circumstances if we are going to get the most out of these uh, technologies. But I, am a, but I am a believer that it is worth the risk. It's partly worth the risk because actually... If, they don't har if we don't harness them, they will harness us, right? We are not going to be able to stop this industrial revolution. And therefore, we either decide we are going to control it, or yet again, you know, we will find ourselves uh, you know, essentially being made poorer by it for many years. 
And so, it, you know, this is, it's, it's a big moment. Now, there are these other issues, which I think are real issues, and these are the ones the Prime Minister has been talking about today, which are to do with the rate of change in AI posing, you know, I hate the word existential, but as existential risks. And there's no question that there are both philosophical challenges about the nature of life. I think we are creating what some would regard as a silicone life form. Um, and, you know, th that's going to pose us all sorts of problems about who we are. And it's also going to be incredibly scary because these silicone life forms are going to be effectively godlike as far as their, you know, essentially their intellectual abilities are compared to any of us, right? So this, uh, uh, an understanding of what life is is going is, is to be challenged. But equally... You know, and this is something the Prime Minister talked about today, there is this risk um, that we will lose control of them and they will start doing things to us that we can't control. And indeed, there is this other risk, related risk, that in the hands of very bad actors, and we've seen only recently how many bad actors there are in the world, that, you know, weapons of mass destruction could be um, developed, for example, misusing some of these services, um, uh, 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 you know, and, and sooner than we might think. I mean, just, I'll just leave you with one, before we move on, one statistic about all of this. I don't know how many of you have used ChatGPT, GPT4, Pi, and the rest. And when you use them for the first time, you do think, this is unbelievable. I can have a conversation, uh, you know, with my phone. And, and you can have, a, you know, some of them, you could actually speak to them. And they, you know, you li literally is an extraordinarily intelligent conversation that you can have. Uh, they are now um, working, uh, they're training updates to all of these models, which will be up to a thousand times more powerful, a thousand times more powerful in the first six months of next year, right? So if you think these services are already off the charts extraordinary, you know, it is nothing com compared with what we're going to see next year. So the change is really extraordinary. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not surprised. I think that's actually rather a good thing um, that the Prime Minister has summoned, um, whether or not an achievement is another matter, but summoned people from across the world to talk about these risks next week. Whether it'll turn out to be cosmetic or something fundamental, I don't know. But it's the right, it's, it is the right thing to do to recognise that among all the other big trends that are happening, this is, I think, arguably, certainly in an economic and social sense, the biggest. Yeah. Well, look, Robert's been wanting to talk at that length about artificial intelligence on the Peston programme for about six months. So we finally did it. The, the only other person, I think, who's as enthusiastic about AI, particularly in its applications in the NHS, as Robert, was, was Tony Blair. We went to go and speak to him about this, Robert. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but he seems to also agree with you that this is something that's coming and government needs to grasp it. Um, I'm also glad that we, we, did, we didn't end on the bit that we thought was going to be hopeful and about growth on weapons of mass destruction. We, we moved past that bit, which I think is important. I mean, before we talk about politics, um, to finish it and yeah. go to some questions and some policy, yeah. wrapped up in what you were saying is sort of how we view risk and how we view the potential dangers and the potential challenges that we face from events outside of our control. I mean... When you're writing a book like this that's about the economy and about what's happened in Britain in particular over the recent years, you can't sort of ignore, and we get this a lot when we talk about what's gone wrong in politics, you can't ignore the things that have happened. So whether that's COVID, the war in Ukraine, um, Brexit and the rest of it. I mean, one of the things that you do say in the book is that these events were worse than they could have been because we were in a worse place going into them, economically and politically, but that they have given us a reason to rethink how we think about risk. I wonder if it's worth sort of briefly just explaining what that is before we move on to sort of the politics and policy bit of this. Yeah, so this is... We were hoping to end on a slightly hopeful note, but perhaps we won't. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk to you about catastrophe, right? And so, so one of the things that um, I expect... So as Kish pointed out, I was totally immersed in the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Um, and, you know, I still slightly bear the scars of uh, being blamed at the time for the financial crisis, which was displacement activity on quite a big scale. Um, and, uh, the, but what I did, the, the thing that I, the positive thing that I thought would come out of it, right, was that I thought that the people who run this place would recognise that when you see what, people regarded as a high-impact 
catastrophic but low probability risk materialising, what statisticians normally call a long tail risk, when you see it materialising, you would then think about um, how we are protected against other low probability, high impact, potentially catastrophic risks. Um, uh, because the thing, one of the most startling things about that crisis in 2007, 2008, is the entire uh, establishment, when it come, came to economic governance, whether it was central bankers, whether it was finance ministers, senior people in the city, they did not see the crash coming until it was way too late. Right? So having learned that we were not uh, ahead of the curve enough and we were not in a position to protect ourselves enough, surely um, we would then you know, um, analyse the other potential risks that were coming down the track and protect us. And then COVID happens. And what did we discover across the world? Actually, not in the Far East, but certainly in the West and in this country, we di did not have the resources to cope with the pandemic, right? Whether it was adequate, you know, we've got this enormous uh, inquiry, very expensive inquiry going on, at the conclusion of which will be we weren't prepared enough, right? Um, and, um, but, it's, but, it's, but that's not the only uh, risk that we you know, hadn't been prepared enough. Frankly, NATO, the West, was not prepared, despite the fact that there were tons of warnings for um, Putin going into Ukraine. And again, that was an event that had systemic consequences. What's going on in the Middle East uh, at the moment was completely forecastable, right? But again, you know, we have been, to a large extent, caught on the hop, right? Now, there are a number of things that you can analyse in terms of why we don't prepare for these catastrophic events. One of them is, if you're a politician, um, you are incentivised to deliver the short-term gain that you think you're going to win your votes, but spending money on a risk that may never materialise is you know, not something that's, in a period of, of, of scarce resources, it's not something you're going to give a very high priority to. The other thing that we, just in terms of the analytical framework, get completely wrong, there's a thing called the Risk Register, which um, the Cabinet Office publishes. They published uh, the, the latest one this summer. And what it does is it analyses a whole series of risks. So I'll give you an example. One of them would be knocking out the national grid, right? Um, now, if the national grid were knocked out by a serious cyber attack, the economic and indeed health consequences would be incredibly serious, right? If, you know, and, and actually they talk about the scale of the damage that, it, that would be done if we, sim if we simply can't keep the lights on. You know, people will die in hospitals, you know, businesses won't be able to keep going, the economy will uh, implode and people will die. Right? This is a very, very, very serious risk. Um, but then they attach a low probability to it. And once you attach a low probability to something, well, basically the instinct of politicians and uh, civil servants is, mm, if we spend money on that, you know, it's a waste of money, it'll never happen. Um, but here is, here is, in a sense, the sort of basic maths that we all need to understand. If you look around the world at the moment, whether it is the risk of China uh, trying to take control of Taiwan, which I happen to think is really quite big, right? um, or uh, a really extreme climate change-related disaster, where, again, I think the risks here are really, you know, really quite significant. It is possible to come up with maybe 10 um, different potentially catastrophic events, high impact events, uh, each of which, the probability of each of which may be low. Okay? But unfortunately, under the basic rules of how you calculate probability, the risk of one of them happening is pretty high. Right? And you know, the, 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 I think that we are back in a period of really quite 
significant number of high-risk events, and I don't think our politicians are facing up to it, and I don't think we're facing up to what needs to be done. I, I mean, uh, maybe we should move on uh, to, to a slightly less depressing subject, though. But, but, there, but there is actually, there are, lit, there are literally, there are very straightforward things that you can do. Okay, so one of the things that we uh, did after uh, insurers in the uh, 1990s stopped covering terrorism risks um, because they just said the risks were, they, just, they felt the risks were uninsurable, um, a sort of public-private insurance reinsurer was created. Right? Government set up effectively a, 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 an insurance fund. It's called Pool Re. Right? And what, what happens is they cover the risk on the basis of premiums they take first from the insurers and then from, from all of us. Um, and one of the things we ought to be doing, just as a very straightforward practical measure, is looking at those uh, sorts of risks where we cannot get the private sector to cover the costs and, and, and developing schemes of this sort. Because there is no question that if you have these pools of capital that, that can then be deployed, actually you can get yourself out of the inevitable holes significantly faster than would otherwise be the case. Also, when you price the risk, and this is the other important lesson of these of, 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 of markets. Markets fail um, you know, when they cannot price uh, a particular risk. So one of the reasons we have more climate change than we would like is because markets don't price the disasters that carbon emissions cause. And we still haven't got decent pricing mechanisms for this. But if you actually create these sorts of vehicles where you force uh, people to recognise the price, then also their behaviour changes. And you protect, you protect yourself. Uh, uh, and we protect you know, our country and our economy in a rather better way. So, Robert, um, you, you started to stray into what we ought to do, which is probably what we should do to finish our bit and, and go to some questions. It might help provide some questions. Mm. I was going to say, in the interest of lightening it up, maybe we should talk about Liz Truss. Um, because one of the sort of the, the legacies of that period of time, an incredible period of time it was to cover in politics, is that it feels like our politicians are more worried than normal about thinking boldly because they've seen what happens when you think too boldly or the things that you're thinking boldly don't quite work in the way that you want them to. So what we try and do at the end of the book is flag some discussions that we think need to be had in politics, mm. some ideas that need to be spoken about, not because they're necessarily the right thing to do, but because ignoring them makes things worse. Um, so I thought, shall we briefly mention a couple of those and yeah. then throw to questions and see if people are interested in sure. any other well, why don't you Why don't you pick out a so, couple of your favourites? I think one of the things that we first talk about is whether the political system is working in a way to generate what we want it to generate. And Robert talked about the lack of desire to think about things in a long-term way. Um, I think another thing that a lot of people find very frustrating is a lack of desire for people to work cross-party on things that are going to happen for a long time, regardless of who's in power. So we say, for example, is it time to start thinking about reforming the political system in a very serious way? People talk about House of Lords reform forever, and then they tend not to actually do it, and it seems like that's going to happen again. So do we need to rethink about what our MPs do? Do we need to split up the role of an MP, which is supposed to be a constituency MP who essentially is a social worker, a representative in Parliament, and a minister who produces policy? Is it unrealistic to ask MPs to do all that? Should we split those roles between the two chambers? Should we change the system by which we elect those MPs so that different parties get a look in and we have a bigger conversation in our national politics? So, so can I just ask you a question? Who, who here thinks that we get the quality of MPs we deserve? Is, there, is anybody going to volunteer that? No. And, and, I, you know, and I think we have got to find a way to persuade people to go back into public services more generally, right? I mean, one of the problems, you know, it's not just MPs, actually, the civil service. I mean, you know, the problem with talking about this is, you know, I just sound like a boring old git who's been around too long. But honestly, you know, objectively speaking, and because I, I have been in and around power uh, for an awfully long time, um, you know, the quality of people who work in our civil service is not what it was. The quality of people who work in, uh, you know, politicians is not what it was. Um, none of us, I think, like the endemic lying that we have been seeing. 
Um, you know, there is, and, it, and it, it eats away at the soul of a country. Um, the combination of um, dishonesty and uh, lack of, you know, genuine commitment to, to public <coughs> service. So this stuff is urgent. Right? You know, normally when you have a conversation to abolish the household or replace it with something else, people yawn and say, it'll never happen, it's too difficult. But actually, you know, I think we are, we are at a moment where kicking these things into the long grass, um, you know, the, the potential damage is very, very significant. Um, the, you know, these things are, are urgent. I do think, you know, in terms of sequencing, that getting the, you know, Getting living standards up is is a priority. You know, it's the sine qua non of any kind of coming together again um, as a as a nation. Um, but pretty fundamental constitutional reform is important, and I and I and I do think, and this is something that I'd be interesting to know whether anybody, uh, what, 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 you know, what you think about this. I do think that there is a case for saying that the Commons should co should should concentrate much more on policy, and actually what I would like to see is a second chamber that is more focused on constituency work. And, you know, the, you know, it's not to say that you want to break the link between Parliament and people, but, if you, but you know, my view is that what you need, you, you need people with different skills now, um, when it, you know, particularly when it comes to the primary bit of legislation as opposed to the revising bit. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, if we had you know, a reform commons with fewer people who were elected by proportional representation um, and where there was also a, a rather better screening mechanism to make, you know, to essentially establish, you know, whether these people had something to offer, um, then, you know, I think that would be at least a step on the way uh, to restoring some kind of confidence. Robert, I've always wanted to say this to you, but they're telling me we're almost out of time. Um, so, what, um, what, I mean, there are, there are a huge number of debates we start, at the end of, that we start at the end of the book, um, some of which are about the economy. They include, should we think about price controls? Should we think about a central bank currency? There's some stuff about the health service and education. There's even mention about whether we should have a second Brexit referendum, but I'll leave that for the audience to decide if they want to talk about Brexit tonight or not. Let, we should go to some questions. Yep. There are lots of people who want to ask us some questions. So what I will do is I'll take two or three questions at a time. I presume most of them will be for Robert, so I'll send them Robert's way, unless you want me to answer something, in which case say, but I can't imagine what that would be. Um, so yes, questions. Yes, gentlemen there. Hi. Um, a little question on catastrophic risk. Oh, right. um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm Lee. I'm involved in an attempt to reanimate civil defence in the UK. Uh, and the question is, how is this going to be funded? Uh, emergency preparedness, you might call it. There is an exemplar in, in Portugal where there is an insurance levy. Uh, a tiny percentage of every insurance premium goes towards central and local government for emergency preparedness. It's hypothecated. There are very few taxes that are. Um, it's great to hear someone like Robert saying, we should take this kind of preparedness more seriously. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that, please. Okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do two or three yeah. and, then we'll, and then we'll answer. Um, should, should we stick on this side? Another, another question on this side, then we'll come and do the ones over here, just so the mic doesn't have to move all the time. Hello, I'm glad you're very optimistic about saving the economy and democracy. I'm a little bit worried about the fate of your book. And the reason that is, is that <laughs> we live at a time when ideas seem to be the market for ideas of books that have great thinking is very shallow. What, what are the things that inhibit the development of the ideas being taken into the mainstream and actual change from arguments? We have a political class that seems to have no interest in ideas or fresh thinking. The whole of that is just sort of shut down. I wonder if you could say something about what, what hope unless we can think differently. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, one, one more before we go. Should we go to the lady, lady at the back there? Hello. Um, just in light of the recent by-elections, it looks like we will be having a change of Prime Minister Keir Starmer. One of his ambitions, Robert, is to get the highest sustained growth in the EU, but he also says we're not rejoining G7. the Customs Union. G7. And we're not rejoining the single market. How is Labour, a future Labour government, going to get that growth? OK, so ca catastrophic risk, no, no market for ideas, and how do we save the economy with Brexit? Um, uh, so... Uh, so I don't know if you saw the, the US growth figures today, which were incredibly strong. 
Um, I mean, look, uh, um, of, you know, I have to say, one of the things, he's, he's a brave politician, isn't he, Keir Starmer? As a, as a, as a political slogan, highest growth in the G7, that's really going to resonate. Um, but um, uh, he's going to struggle, uh, frankly. Um, and, you know, they ought to be, uh, you know, immersing themselves in the kind of stuff I was talking about earlier, uh, which is artificial intelligence, where there is an enormous prospect to transform uh, growth Prospects, although as I've been discussing, it's 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 uh, it's got risks associated with it. Um, the, uh, but by the end of the Parliament, the highest growth rate in the G7. I mean, you know, um, it's going to be a challenge. Um, the uh, Cosmo was asking about why. Um, we don't have more of a market in interesting ideas. Um, and he's right, it is depressing, actually, that particularly when it comes to the political class, people are massively risk averse. Um, one of the things um, that uh, sort of happens to me on a daily basis when I'm wandering around is people come up to me in the street and what they mostly want to say to me is, why don't the people you interview answer your questions? Um, and it drives people up the wall. Uh, it's one of the reasons people are so dispirited with the political class, because they are so frightened of an open and honest conversation. And um, honestly, Cosmo, at the moment, um, you know, I don't have any sort of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, amazing recipe to turn risk-averse politicians into uh, confident ones who are, you know, prepared to... Uh, for example, talk about some of these sort of slightly mad ideas that we put forward. I mean, my, the, the, my view about, you know, we've got pages of these things at the end. My view is what's really important now is that we do take risks, certainly in debate, certainly in debate. Um, and it is depressing uh, the extent to which we don't have leaders prepared to do that. We, we have um, a role in that as well in the media, right? So there's, there's a... There's a troubling loop where basically a politician floats an idea, somebody, usually in a newspaper, sometimes on television, decides that's a terrible idea, the opposition also decides it's a terrible idea, and before it's really been floated or tested, it's been considered so toxic it's taken off the agenda. So, you know, if we talk about long-term planning, long-term policy, things that aren't just attached to an electoral cycle, there's a role for media in that as well, um, and, and we, we also need to think about that, and I'm sure we will. Well, we do every, you know, we, you know, we do not. I don't think the whole media no, uh, no, no. has that uh, responsibility. The, um, but you also need the competence. I mean, you know, you know, Kish slightly lightheartedly, you know, uh, referred to Liz Truss. She got one thing right, which is that it was, you know, that this low growth didn't unfortunately talk about inequalities. I, I do think actually inequalities are and fairness is central to everything. And she's not interested in that. She thinks, you know, everybody gets lifted up by uh, higher growth and that's all that matters. And I'm not sure that after so many years of widening inequalities, that is enough. But the problem was she had a plan that didn't work and was never going to work. Um, and the fact that she, you know, the, 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 the important thing is debate. She, you know, her aspirations... Some of the policies she didn't enact were perfectly good ones in terms of restarting growth. Some of the planning reforms that they might have done would probably have been good things. But, she, you know, she didn't listen to people who said, if you have 50 billion of tax cuts from borrowing, the markets are going to turn against you. And she just didn't want to hear any of that stuff. And now she's saying it was all some Remainer conspiracy in the city to sink her. Um, I mean, you know, we all want brave and courageous debate, but it's got to be rooted in reality. Um, and, 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 the and, then, and then just, stuff, I mean, right? I haven't really got much more. I mean, you know, I, I felt yours was, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly a, a, a bit of an endorsement of the kind of things that I think are important. I, I mean, broadly, I would agree that what we need is indeed some kind of, um, some kind of levy uh, to fund effectively um, a, 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 you know, a very significant reinsurance pool. Um, uh, and, but whether you do that on households or whether you do it through the sale of existing insurance policies, there are all sorts of technical, you know, technical solutions to this thing, but we've obviously got to go down that route.
tax rises, not tax cuts. Gosh, um, um, that's, don't, we don't hear that said as much, but maybe it's realistic. And yeah. look, how we fund anything is going to be a big part of the next 10 years. So that's interesting. Um, right, should we do some more? Um, should we do another three? Yep, yeah, should we go to the gentleman in the front row and then we'll go back? I, I was in the market when Liz Truss. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think one thing that was interesting was that it really brought about this idea that Britain is a country with twin deficits. It's not a country that has the exorbitant privilege uh, of the US. And so as you say, funding things uh, is something to think about. But Britain, historically, because of its geopolitical position and because of its history of winning wars and being back creditors, does have a lot of goodwill still with creditors. So how much of the solution here is to reestablish British position from a geopolitical standpoint, and as a twin deficit country, then use that to, to be able to fund these projects, because every government is having these conversations, and there's almost a jostling for within the markets of who, whose plan is most credible and who will have the power to execute. Yeah. OK. I think, dangerously, my dad wants to ask a question. He sat there, and then there's a gentleman just next to him as well. Thank you, Kishan. Thank you, Robert, for a fascinating discussion. Um, we're very proud of our NHS, and I'm very proud of our NHS. You've seen many governments come and go, and given the austerity we face at the moment, I'd be really interested to see what your thoughts are of how we fix and support the NHS economically, but also for our sanity. Then I think there was a gentleman literally next to you, so we can do those three together. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm interested to know if you are an optimist about uh, the market pricing climate risk, and if so, how many years do you think it would take to have a proper realistic price for carbon? Right. In, I mean, in any order. <laughs> in any order. There's a lot there. Um, I mean, the, the challenges of the NHS are really very significant at the moment, and we sort of under, right now, uh, we underappreciate the harm that was done from, I don't know, something like 10 years shortly before COVID of relative underfunding uh, of the health service. I mean, you know, obviously George Osborne and David Cameron made a great thing that they were not going to impose real cuts, but, you know, the real growth was something like 1% a year. And if you look at health services across the year, they across the world, normally it requires something like 3 to 4% funding growth. So there have been years of underfunding. Um, we then had the shock of COVID. We are still grappling with the health consequences. I mean, you, you know, there are a surprisingly and rather worryingly large number of people now with post-COVID respiratory problems, heart problems, um, the challenges are really significant. Um, and so although uh, I am, you know, a great optimist that technology will help, funding, you know, we're going to we're gonna have to put more funding in. There is, there is no, uh, there's no ambiguity. We've just got to do it, right? Um, Unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't 100%. So is, your question was what? Who has currently got a credible growth model? Or, or can we re-establish our credentials to be able to fund what we want? I mean, the problem is, we're, we, I mean, in terms of... In, so we do face really big structural problems. I mean, one of the things I haven't talked about is the mess that the last 10 years have put the public finances in. We are more... The interest bill paid by the public sector by the government is more geared to rising inflation than in any other country in the world. Um, one of the things that I'm really worried about at the moment is when we get what's known as a new settled natural rate of interest, um, if that rate of that, that natural rate of interest, the rate of interest you require to keep inflation on target is above the underlying growth rate, then you potentially get into the kind of death spiral with public services where, uh, you know, you're just in a constant cycle of having to make cuts because if you, uh, because the economy is simply not growing fast enough 
to fund the tax, or to produce the tax revenues that will then deliver the public services that we take for granted. And we don't yet know, because we're not yet through this phase of higher inflation, to know where that natural rate, and this shock to the economy that we've seen from, a, from some global and some domestic factors, we're not actually clear um, where that natural rate of interest is going to settle. Um, so there are these big, um, these big imponderables. And in terms of, I mean, you know, broadly, we're not going to get proper carbon pricing, uh, you know, until we have governments, you know, essentially, you know, putting in place, you know, realistic frameworks, which we haven't got at the moment. Um, and, you know, it, you know it, I do think that carbon pricing is the way to go, but it, you know, but it requires much bolder action in terms of, you know, the whole issue of what quotas are allowable and, you know, essentially what the floor price is and the rest of it. OK, should we do a last round of questions? We have to do quick fire answers because I know we're almost there. So we've got a uh, lady sat here, gentleman there, gentleman at the back, and there's one from online, I think, and then we're, we're good. Great. Yes, hello, good evening to you. Uh, we spoke about the economy, we spoke about inflation, growth, etc. But I, I'm just wondering, how do we take care of the base of all that, which is nature, um, in terms of what's your view on the increase of litter in our streets or parks? I don't know if any of you have seen the increase in our parks or streets of litter. Litter is becoming a serious issue in the UK, mm. and I feel that there is very little who's done about how we're going to tackle that. Okay. Yes, economy is important. Yes, growth is important. Inflation is important. But what about what sustains all of us, which is nature? So I'd like to hear your view on that mm -hmm. and how you tackle this and what you do. What's your opinion on that? Okay. Okay. Nature, litter. To ask a depressing question, Robert, which you could oh. write a book about. Which, so I'm a younger person, obviously, and I see drawbridges going up as I get older. I would say, and I'm from quite a privileged background. So, for example, my parents losing their child credit in 2010, then having tuition fees going up to nine grand, housing market now, interest rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess my question is, how would you resolve that? And I'm concerned about the election coming up, where you've got the Tories basically going for the 60-plus vote. I'd argue rurally. Mm -hmm. and sort of how that squares, if that does work or doesn't work. It's similar to the sort of Trump-America question as well, I guess. Great. Was there, was there one more as well? Yeah, gentleman at the back. Yeah, Robert, I, I talk, I have to say, as a civil servant, but I thought there was something a little bit anti-blobby in some of the things that you were saying. So, oh. for example, <laughs> you, you blamed the Royal Free Hospital thing on uh, bureaucracy, you talked about the National Risk Register and cyber resilience of the networks. Probably the audience would come around thinking, oh, well, that's not been funded. Actually, it has. And we all pay a bit towards cyber resilience on our electricity bills. And I wonder, so I guess, you know, it's fine. I'm not, I don't have a thick skin, about a thin skin about being uh, told that I'm the problem. But I wonder whether that discourse that the blob is the problem actually feeds the populism which you hope to fight. I thought you were in the blob, Robert. Well, People on Twitter tell us you're in the blob all the time. Yeah, I might well be. Actually, there's a very, very, very strong defence of the blob in the book, so I'm sorry if, if I, I regard the whole blob... Uh, well, I, it's just a sort of mad, sort of populist right myth, as it were. Um, so, I mean, if you felt, I mean, I think maybe what you are sort of reflecting is the fact that people like you, and I think it's like, you know, I think it's unfair, have been under attack. Um, uh, I mean, broadly, as I've tried to say, you know, I think Kish and I are on your side. We believe in public service, right? Um, or what I, but, you, be, you know, if you believe in public service as we do, that doesn't mean that you can't be a friendly critic of some things when they go wrong. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, the Royal Free debacle, I mean, look, if I developed it further, I think it's broadly to, because what happened at the time was there was some tabloid scare, it might be the Daily Mail, I can't remember, and everybody panicked, including the civil service, right? But when you were talking, you said it was a bureaucracy, right? So it's 
Well, I mean, what I'm say, basically saying, what, but, uh, all I meant was, maybe I expressed myself, uh, you know, less subtly than I should have done, uh, but, you know, what I meant was, the, rather than standing f firm against, you know, what was an irrational attack from the tabloids, they panicked and they closed it down. They didn't have to panic and close it down, but they did. And so, uh, uh, this is not a criticism of those people, I understand the pressures. OK, but but we we've all got, to, you know, when you see irrationality, the only way through any of this is to call, you know, not in this sort of mad, intolerant way um, that we see on social media and in much political discourse. But, you know, we, we've got to stand up for rationalism. Right? And when you see mad, irrational attacks, you can't just close something down on that basis. Um, and and uh, you know, this is just what this is just you know this is just you know a, this is just a little microcosm of something that I think is a is a wider issue. I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying the fault is largely of civil servants. I think it's more it's more of elected politicians who uh, literally can't bear the idea uh, of you know standing up to actually a media that is now more fragmented than it's ever been, is much less powerful than it's ever been, but yet somehow um, still calls the shots rather too often. Um, and then, what was the other? Um, young people. Oh, young people. going up for young people. There's, I, there's a lot of that in the book. There's an enormous amount. And why don't you give hope? <laughs> <laughs> so, a couple of things. Um, one, I think that the definition of what a young person is has been getting older and older and older as more and more people start to struggle. There comes a point when the definition of the young people who are being ignored is so old that it includes most of the population, and at that point, it's, un it's electorally impossible to ignore them. So time is on our side, as a fellow young person, I hope still. Um, two, I think that despite the short-term pain, and it's considerable short-term pain of what's going on with inflation and interest rates, um, what's going on in the housing market, what higher interest rates over a longer period of time might mean for young people. If you bought a house during COVID, like me, it's quite worrying. But otherwise, I think there's, there's signs that a higher interest rate world is probably better for younger people than a lower interest rate world. Robert explains that very well in the book. I will do it less well here, but it's, it's in there. And I think that's a cause for hope. Um, and in terms of sort of opportunities that were once there not being there anymore, yes, in many ways. Um, but also, I think, with technology, with the possibilities, with how quickly things change in the world, more opportunities are coming all the time. And it might be that young people are in the best place to harness those opportunities. So I hope that things are going to get better. I think they will get better, not least because I think the politics are going to become incredibly hard if you don't commit to making things better for young people. No, no, it's not that. I tell you. So, so, so the interest. So, the, this is this is one of those sort of slightly techie things. But th there are two ways. Uh, look, there's obviously, if you happen to be on the housing market, if you happen to be on the housing ladder now, and your mortgage is being rep re repriced, it's a fucking pain to use a technical term. But, um, but the, um, but if we take the view beyond this very significant period of dislocation. Uh, particularly for people who are just on the housing ladder. Um, and you believe, as I do, that this era of higher, higher interest rates is here to stay for a number of years, it will have two relatively beneficial effects for younger people. One is that uh, you know, we will see the price of um, houses come down. That is going to happen. Secondly, probably more importantly in a way, the return that young people will, ret will earn on their savings will be higher. What part of the problem for young people is pointless, pointless saving for a pension, you know, when interest rates are close to zero because you just can't accumulate any decent pot. Now, you know, you can, if you're lucky and you put your money, uh, you know, in NVIDIA, you know, designers of the chips that, underpin all of AI and you put them in at the bottom, you know, um, you, you'll do very well. But if you're simply following a ra rather more conventional investment strategy, higher interest rates will make it easier for young people to accumulate over the course of a lifetime something that may well be able to pay a pension at the end of it. So it, you have to make it, you have to just draw this distinction between the immediate shock and the, and the, the sort of longer term steady state rather beneficial environment. I'm, I'm aware that if we were on ITV, we would have run into the next programme by now, because we, we are over. There, there was something on, on nature and literature. Oh, sorry. I, I, I think there so, is so, maybe, so, there's so, a link there, isn't there? Well, I think it is. So, 
for me, the litter problem is the litter problem. There's, there's two things. One is respect for nature is obviously incredibly important. And, you know, um, we talk about the you know the global warming aspect of uh, you know the environmental problems we face, but more broadly, you know, essentially. Um, you know, we do have to respect, reflect, respect, excuse me, the planet way more than we have been doing. But there's also a point about community in littering. What, what littering is a manifestation of is the fact that we don't respect and we don't respect each other enough, right? And you know, it's to do with this whole fragmentation of uh, our communities, right? And and you know, what we somehow have to build or rebuild, and we were here 15 years ago, and it has been, uh, unfortunately, been undermined to a large extent, but we have to rebuild confidence in each other, respect for each other. Um, and, 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 you know, again, I'm afraid, I do think, you know, rebuilding a, an economy that works for people is fundamental even to something as basic as how we treat each other. Don't you think you need to be taking a little bit further than just a community, such as Singapore, a country like this, have a system in place, yeah. a law in place, which forbidden litter. So perhaps we can copy the way they approach litter. Well, one of the things that, that Robert draws on throughout the book is that there are lots of examples throughout the world that we should probably be paying more attention to than we currently do. And it's easy for us to become quite insular and only think about what's going on in our debate when there are things perhaps like that in Singapore, perhaps in other examples that we should learn from. Yeah. Um, we, we better wind up, I think. That is it. I'm, I'm afraid yes. we've we've we've, um, we've gone over. We have gone over, and we've we, you've you've um, been very indulgent. I was going to say you can, uh, if you, because we have only literally skimmed the surface of, of what's in this book. So uh, we, we're very happy to sign copies for you out there. It's probably it's not as cheap as I would like it to be. But one of the themes in the book is how the Bank of England has let us down on inflation. So you're going to have to blame the Bank of England, not us. Yes.